I'll just begin with this initial slide. And uh, this is a slide that I'm sure many of you have seen before if you got to any kind of aging-related conference. And it simply depicts what we're experiencing in terms of an aging population. So we know that there's a rise in the aging population. And with that rise in the aging population, we're tending to see this increase in terms of projections of individuals who will be diagnosed with some sort of non-communicable uh, non or uh, chronic disease, such as Alzheimer's disease or even cardiovascular disease. Um, but we do know that there are individual differences in the aging process. Uh, some of my own work has shown that we see different trajectories in cognitive aging in late life, where some people show drastic declines in cognitive function, others show minimal age-related declines over time, and then others show maintenance in cognitive function over time. And we've also seen in the literature um, that there are predictors of who will maintain cognitive function over time. And some of my own work and that of my colleagues have shown that many of these factors are malleable in nature. They're lifestyle-based behaviors. And so with that, I've become very interested in evaluating lifestyle behaviors. And so some of them are just right here with respect to stress management. So we know that stress, intermittent stress, chronic stress uh, exposure has detrimental effects on our immune system, on our heart, on our brain. Um, and so we want to manage chronic stress, but also we're looking at diet patterns, so Western diet versus the prudent diet pattern, as well as physical activity and social engagement. We know that isolation uh, has horrible effects with respect to uh, longevity. Now, I also like to propose that in order to cultivate wellness with aging, that many of these lifestyle behaviors have a foundation through the cultivation of mindfulness. And so today I will be focusing on my work in mindfulness. And so in terms of the roadmap from what I will discuss over the next uh, half hour or so, I'll begin by defining mindfulness. What is mindfulness? I'll give a brief description of a particular mindfulness-based intervention, namely uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, or MBSR. I'll then talk about some neural mechanisms of mindfulness-based interventions, which sort of provide a rationale as to why we might think that mindfulness training may be beneficial for um, older adults or for maintaining health as we age. And then I'll just talk about some of my research looking at the associations between trait mindfulness and well-being, as well as mindfulness training and well-being among older adults. So. To begin, what is mindfulness? So there are many definitions of mindfulness, and uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of debate going on in terms of how do we define mindfulness. One of the most uh, popular definitions is that mindfulness is paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and without judgment, or while suspending judgment. And so it's this intentional, moment-to-moment -moment awareness of thoughts, sensations, feelings, whether they're neutral, negative, or positive. So we're trying to provide space for all of these different experiences while suspending judgment or with this um, attitude of acceptance. Now, there's this lovely quote by Viktor Frankl, who was an Austrian neurologist, uh, psychiatrist, but most importantly, a uh, survivor of the Holocaust. And he's author of many books, one being Man's Search for Meaning, which is a wonderful book I recommend it to anyone who hasn't read it. And this lovely quote by Viktor Frankl states, between the stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our freedom and power to choose our response. Now, this is really what we're doing with mindfulness. It's this mindful space. Can we create this space to really acknowledge the various experiences that um, we are actually experiencing in this moment, regardless of its balance, neutral, positive, negative, and providing space for any kind of experiences that we may be having. And what I find really fascinating is that, you know, Viktor Frankl was not a Buddhist. He was not a mindfulness practitioner. Um, but it just shows that there are individuals who have this propensity for mindfulness. 
So we do have what we call trait mindfulness. It's seen as a characteristic of certain individuals. And this is the propensity to self-regulate one's awareness to internal and external stimuli while adopting a non-judgmental attitude. Now, of course, some of us need a little more help. There are some individuals who are naturally very mindful. They can attend to their environment. They're very aware. But for the most of us, we tend to live our life in automatic pilot. And so I'm sure that this is something that many of you sort of um, uh, have felt in terms of, you know, you get into your car, you turn the key in the ignition, before you know it, you're at your destination without really remembering, you know, where did I turn left? Where did I turn right? And so there are many moments in the day where we are on automatic pilot and we tend to miss quite a bit uh, of our life. So this is trait mindfulness. And for those of us who need a little more help, there are mindfulness-based interventions that exist. And so mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction is one such uh, intervention that um, has received a lot of attention over the last uh, 30 years or so. And uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction was introduced to us in the 1970s by John kabat -Zinn. And this practice uh, has its traditions. It's, it, it comes from Buddhist traditions, but it's been secularized. So it's taken out some of those more traditional components so that's more palatable uh, to Westerners. And so it's a secularized, manualized program, and the fact that it's manualized makes it very attractive for researchers because we can make sure that we're controlling certain aspects of this particular intervention. It's an eight-week group-based program, and during the eight weeks, uh, participants learn various mind-body techniques, mindfulness techniques, including the sitting meditation, body scan, mindful movement, which is light hatha yoga, um, mindful eating, mindful walking, as well as informal practices, so recognizing positive and negative events during your daily life, as well as uh, noticing um, stressful communications and how your body reacts to these stressful, uh, stressful communications. So the question is, how might the cultivation of mindfulness benefit healthy aging? And if we look at the mechanisms in terms of what's going on when we're engaging in mindfulness practice, a lot of it are these various cognitive processes. So for example, maintaining awareness of current experience. So let's just say we're engaging in a sitting practice and we're focusing on the breath and the movement of the breath. So we are maintaining awareness of the experience of the breath. And this, with this, we're practicing sustained attention bringing attention back to the present moment when it wanders. So when we are sitting and we're attending to the breath, your mind is gonna move off to something else. It's, we, have, you know, we have a very limited attention span usually, and it's, it really is um, sort of a consequence of our society. Um, you know, we kind of have been introduced to this MTV type of nature where we don't have to pay too much attention to anything for too long. Um, and so what we see is that we have what we call monkey mind or squirrel mind, where our attention wanders off, you know, after a few minutes, after a few minutes of attending to the breath. But that's the part of mindfulness. That is mindfulness. As soon as you notice that your attention has wandered off, that's a moment of mindfulness. And then you bring back your attention to the breath or whatever your point of focus is and continue with your practice. So what this is called, what we're, what we're practicing with this is attention switching. The third piece, so decreasing cognitive rumination by acknowledging and letting go of stimuli that grab our attention. So usually what happens in a practice is that perhaps your mind will wander off to a thought, and that thought is emotionally charged. And through the practice of mindfulness, what we learn is eventually to decenter ourselves from that emotional balance so that we see the thought as just a thought, and it's not necessarily who we are. And so with this, we're engaging in attentional inhibition. So as you can see, there are various executive functions that, that are being trained formally through this practice. So we are cultivating cognitive control. We're also co uh, cultivating emotion regulation through the practice of uh, mindfulness training. 
And we know that experience changes the brain. So we've seen this, for example, with exercise. We know that um, in older adults who engage in an exercise program, we see changes in the brain. We see changes in hippocampal volume, which we know is important for learning and memory and is implicated in uh, the, the development of dementia. Well, similar to exercise, with mindfulness, we see neuroplasticity. We see changes in the brain in terms of increased hippocampal volume, increased temporal parietal junction volume, increased cingulate cortex volume, as well as, well as activation of the ACC. We see um, uh, increased medial prefrontal cortex volume and the connectivity between prefrontal cortex and amygdala to essentially buffer that, that emotional response. And we also see increase in insular activity, which we know is associated with interceptive awareness as well as stress reactivity. So we see changes in the brain. We see changes in function and in terms of morphology of the brain through the practice of uh, mindfulness uh, techniques. Now, there is a problem with mindfulness literature, I have to say, is that there are, there are many issues and it's not a panacea. Um, there are individuals out there who are saying that mindfulness will basically save the world and I'm not here to say that to you today. Um, there are a number of limitations in terms of the current literature, including, um, you know, uh, statements being made based on very small sample size. Um, there are very few rigorously designed studies that have been published. So with many of these studies looking at mindfulness interventions, either many of them have no control group or they only include a waitlist control. And so we do know that there's this powerful effect of expectancy effects when engaging in certain interventions. And getting something is always better than getting nothing at all. So there are some well-designed studies out there, but there are fewer of them. Um, Another thing is that claims are based on different forms of mindfulness-based interventions. So you'll have various uh, interventions including more traditional forms like Vipassana or Zen meditation or Kirtan Kriya versus more modern forms of mindfulness interventions such as MBSR or MBCT, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. So to suggest that all of these various forms of mindfulness training are doing the exact same thing might be faulty. Um, also, the majority of research is conducted in younger adults and in clinical populations. So when I became interested in the field of mindfulness, there was really no research looking at mindfulness for older adults. And so that's what was really, I found very intriguing about this, this line of research. So, the cultivation of mindfulness for healthy aging. This was something that I started to think about and started to pursue uh, early on uh, during my, when I was first uh, brought on to, to Ryerson University. And so I'm just going to first talk about the association between trait mindfulness, so that, that natural propensity to be mindful, and some outcomes of well-being in later adulthood. So this is actually a recent study that came out looking at the association between trait mindfulness and expectations regarding aging among middle-aged and older adults. And uh, I worked on this with my collaborator, uh, Brad Meisner from York University, um, who, does, who specializes in the area of aging stereotypes. And so for this study, uh, this was a, a, a paper-based study in 201 older adults, 55 to 80 years old. 64% were, uh, were female, 90% were Caucasian, so quite homogeneous in terms of a, a sample. 75% uh, were college educated or higher. 15.42 um, reported being from a low socioeconomic status and 84 uh, from mid to high socioeconomic status. And 43 were retired. So these participants completed a number of surveys, uh, two of them being integral to this research question. So the first was the five-factor uh, mindfulness questionnaire. And the five-factor mindfulness questionnaire um, is composed of these five subsets. So five subsets that, that really sort of describe um, uh, mindfulness and what we're cultivating in mindfulness. So observing, describing, acting with awareness, non-judgment, and non-reacting. And they also completed the expectations regarding aging questionnaire, and the expectations uh, uh, essentially looked at various um, domains in terms of function, including general health, cognitive hardiness or function, mental health, sexual function, pain, etc. Now, 
what we found was that higher trait mindfulness was associated with more positive expectations regarding aging among this uh, sample of 55 plus um, uh, individuals. Also, what was important is that the association was driven by acting with awareness and non-judgment facets of mindfulness. So it wasn't necessarily the describing or the observing piece. It was really this, this piece of awareness and acceptance. Now, we also controlled for socioeconomic status and retirement because these two factors can associate with expectations regarding aging. And what we found was that when we controlled for these covariates, the non-judgment facet accounted for an additional 14% of the variance in expectations regarding aging, with higher um, uh, non-judgmental uh, attitude being associated with more positive expectations regarding aging. Now, yes, this is not necessarily a health outcome, but why is this important? Well, there's a large body of literature showing that the internalization of negative aging stereotypes predicts negative health outcomes. In particular, predicts lower engagement in health-promoting behaviors. So if you have negative aging uh, attitude or have internalized these negative aging stereotypes, you're less likely to engage in physical activity. You're, you're less likely to um, uh, have a, a healthy uh, diet pattern intake. Um, you're more likely to show decreased engagement with community activities and cognitive stimulation activities. Um, it's associated with poor functional health, greater brain pathology, and decreased longevity. So through this, we may suggest that mindfulness may therefore offset the negative impact of negative aging stereotypes. Of course, this is something that we would need to test empirically, and this is uh, something that I, am, that I and, and uh, Dr. Brad Meisner would be interested in pursuing uh, in the near future. So what about the association between trait mindfulness and actual outcomes of wellness in older adults? So this was a study um, uh, that, that I conducted with my, my graduate student, Sasha Malia. And in this study, we recruited 73 healthy, community-dwelling older adults, so non-demented, high-functioning older adults, 69 years of age around um, at the time of testing, and 75% uh, were female. So we tend to have a large uh, sample of females in, in, in our studies, unfortunately. So what did we find? Well, higher trait mindfulness was associated with reporting fewer depressive symptoms using the geriatric depression scale, better quality of life with the quality of life scale. They reported be better overall stress profile using the stress scan. And the stress scan is really this, it's like a 120-something question battery that provides you with um, indices of, of um, cognitive hardiness, well-being, coping strategies, and we saw that individuals who are high on trait mindfulness tended to be a little more um, on the healthier side with respect to these behaviors. We also found with respect to objective cognitive tests that individuals with higher trait mindfulness perform more better, uh, perform better on the trail making test uh, task B, so looking at executive function task switching. We saw that there was an association here and also we saw the association between trait mindfulness and cognitive performance on this task was actually mediated by perceived stress. Now, the question following this study was, can we improve psychosocial and cognitive well-being in older adults through mindfulness training? So we see an association between trait mindfulness, but can we train this, can we train mindfulness to improve some of these psychosocial and cognitive indices of health? So I'll now turn to... Um, my studies that have looked at mindfulness training in older adults. The first one looking at mindfulness training for healthy community dwelling older adults, so non-demented, high functioning older adults, which in hindsight was a little problematic and I'll show you why later. Um, and study two, mindfulness training for older caregivers of persons with neurodegenerative disease. So a, a highly stressed uh, older adult cohort uh, or subsample in, in our population. So beginning with study one, three objectives, and the objectives are the same across the two studies, to determine whether MBSR can improve executive functioning in a sample of health, healthy older adults, 
Number two, to examine the effects of MBSR and psychosocial well-being. And number three, to the, determine the benefits of MBSR from a qualitative perspective. This was actually my first time doing qualitative uh, research using mixed methods design. And uh, before this, I was a purely quant person. And through this type of uh, intervention, it really made me value um, qualitative data. So, the sample for this study uh, comprised of 97 community-dwelling older adults around 69 years of age at time of uh, T1 testing, 75% female, education was about 16 years, and participants were randomized to the MBSR group versus an active control group. So remember, this is one limitation in previous research in that usually it's a, either no control or weightless control. So we want to have an active control group that can control for nonspecific factors including the social engagement by meeting up once a week for eight weeks. Um, the reading and relaxation program included progressive muscle relaxation, so to control for that, pro for that uh, relaxation piece. And it also had a mini book club, so controlling sort of for the cognitive stimulation. The measures, so uh, pre and post intervention, participants completed some cognitive tests, including trails making test A and B, the cow at fluency and animals test. Psychosocial questionnaires included the mindfulness attention awareness scale for mindfulness, the perceived stress scale, the geriatric depression scale, and the quality of life scale. So. Here are just some demographic factors to show that randomization was done relatively well, that uh, the two groups were, were relatively um, uh, equivalent across these demographic factors. Now, so looking at the impact of MBSR on cognitive function, what did we find? Absolutely nothing. So we saw absolutely no change, not within the group, not between the groups with respect to cognitive function um, from pre to post testing. And so this is just uh, analyses from intention to treat. It's a mixed two by two ANCOVA controlling for age, sex, and education, which we always control for, for cognitive outcomes. So a little disappointing there. With respect to psychosocial factors, well, we found that our, our, our MBSR group did not increase that much on mindfulness. However, there was a trend for our active control group to show a better increase, more of an increase in mindfulness. It wasn't statistically significant, but we're seeing a trend there. We see no uh, group differences for perceived stress or for depression. We did, however, find a significant difference between the groups for quality of life, with the MBSR showing increase in quality of life post-program relative to the reading and relaxation group. Now, let's, so, so again, overall, not very impressive. We're seeing some benefits in quality of life, okay, but not for cognition and not for perceived stress or depression, which is usually where we want to see these, these effects. Now, let's look at the qualitative outcome. So I'll just begin with the, the, the reading and relaxation. So the reading and relaxation participants reported qualitative benefits of, of taking part in this, in this study. They really did enjoy uh, the group. And so the question that was posed was, you know, if any, were there any um, uh, benefits that you experienced from, from participating in this program? And so, you know, they, they reported emotional and physical um, uh, benefits, including relaxation, social interaction, engagement and discussion with respect to physical. We see tension relief as well as better sleep. Now, if we look at the MBSR group, what we see here is... Um, uh, more themes, more nodes, qualitative nodes that are coming out with respect to the uh, qualitative analysis. And it's quite interesting because if you, if you think about positive psychology and some of the work by Fredrickson and the broaden and build model by Fredrickson, Fredrickson, it suggested that with the cultivation of positive emotions, we are able to broaden our thinking repertoires which then leads to us building greater resources, which then leads to greater health. And so if we think from this positive psychology point of view, what we may be able to see is that we have this sort of broad, broadening of thought repertoires with the amount of qualitative benefits that are stemming from our participants. And just a few of the quotes that came from this group. It helped me manage unexpected multiple competing demands on my attention without being stressed or ineffective because of distraction. 
So this is associated with increased awareness and less reactivity. I learned that other people experience the same kind of things, not just me. I'm more aware of the good things in life and learn not to dwell on negative thoughts. I learned the importance of relaxation and not browbeating yourself. Self-compassion is such a huge piece of mindfulness training. Um, and many of us have very striving attitudes and we're very hard on ourselves. It, it, and it, it is obviously a, an outcome of our culture. I was able to keep up physical activity more than I would with the help of a more focused mind. Yoga relieved my sciatica and yoga helped my back pain. And finally, I sleep better and remembering to be mindful when eating. So we're seeing sort of this impact in terms of general mood, positivity, as well as some physical and behavioral outcomes as well. Okay. So in terms of study conclusions for study one, mindfulness for healthy community dwelling older adults may be beneficial, but there are no meaningful findings with respect to um, the cognitive benefits and the more qualitative um, uh, psychosocial, uh, sorry, quantitative psychosocial outcomes with the exception of quality of life. Qualitative reports suggest that mindfulness training may provide emotional and physical benefits for older adults. Now, of course, all of this has to be considered in light of the study limitations. One of the biggest ones, with the, these were high-functioning individual, highly educated, high-functioning. They performed very well on the cognitive tests, and so perhaps there were ceiling effects. There wasn't much, much room for movement. They were also not very stressed. So uh, what's important to think about is that, well, we're not seeing improvements following the program, but what would be interesting, and unfortunately, you know, uh, I have no money to do this, is to actually follow these individuals over time to look at maintenance over time in these high-functioning individuals. So learning from this study, I then thought, okay, well, I have to look at an older adult population that, who are actually stressed, who might actually benefit from a stress management program. And so I turned my attention to caregivers because we know that as a group, caregivers are considered a model of chronic stress. We see that caregivers are at increased risk for a number of stress-related health ailments. And so I wanted to focus on family caregivers of persons with neurodegenerative disease. And so in this study, I, get, I had the same three objectives. I also have one-year follow-up data, but I didn't have enough time to, to properly analyze the data for you today. Um, but that, that is something that will come. So with respect to the sample, we had 57 older family caregivers who were about 66 years of age at time one testing. 80% female, which is not unusual. These are family caregivers. Usually females tend to take on this role more so than males. We used pseudo-randomization for this particular study because it was very difficult to get caregivers to clear up their schedule to be randomized to any day. So basically we said, here are two days, choose one of these two. They would choose the day without knowing whether it was, a, whether it was MBSR or the control group. Um, so they weren't aware what they were getting into, but they still got to choose the day of attendance. In terms of measures, again, we have trail making A and B, digit span, cow at fluency in animals, and psychosocial questionnaires, this time using the five-factor model questionnaire, perceived stress scale, CESD for depression, quality of life, caregiver burden, and Rosenberg self-esteem. Hmm. So, in terms of demographics, we see that, um, unfortunately, randomization did not work very well. Our MBSR group were younger than the psych ed group. Oh, I should also say what our control group was. So the control group, the active control group, was a psychoeducation social support group, which is very common to what we see in terms of treatment as usual in our community. So psychoeducation social support is uh, very popular. Um, so this was our, our control. And so, of course, in any analyses, because there were group differences in age, we always control for age, but we also control for education and uh, sex. So what did we find? Again, with cognitive outcomes, even though we saw within group benefits in our MBSR group, so we see significant decrease in time on the, on, on the B trail, set shifting. We did not see between group differences. Similar for the digit span task, although we saw within group improvements between group uh, differences were not significant. 
With respect to the uh, CAWIT, uh, similarly, even though we're seeing improvements in our MBSR, the differences are not statistically different relative to psychoed. However, when we look at the psychosocial outcomes, what we see are meaningful changes with respect to uh, depressive symptoms, so significant decline in terms of depressive symptoms in MBSR relative to psychoed and in perceived stress relative to psychoed. However, we did not see statistically different group between group differences for self-esteem, quality of life, or caregiver burden. Even though we are seeing improvements, they're not better than psychoed. And I just kind of want to bring up this meta-analysis that was conducted by Liu Chen and Sun in 2018, which basically suggests the same thing, is that when we're looking at mindfulness-based interventions in caregivers with respect to psychosocial outcomes, we're seeing improvements really specific to depression and perceived stress, but not really things like burden or anxiety um, or, or quality of life. With respect to the qualitative outcomes, again, we're seeing more nodes, more thematic nodes for our MBSR group relative to our control group. So for the control group, the, the really the, the biggest benefit was that there was social support. And then they also talked about the educational piece. With MBSR, uh, participants talked about pain management, Oh, so here. Um, so here, they talked about social support, so friendship, camaraderie, learning to listen and not just hear, not feeling alone in this situation that has been thrust upon me. Self-care, it helped me to understand that I can't do everything. I need to take time for myself, which was very difficult for these caregivers to actually come to terms with. I am more relaxed but need to continue practicing. I am more calm. I can deal with stress. Uh, problem solving skills, um, oh no, sorry, acceptance and letting be. I've accepted my mother's situation. I am now able to spend quality time with my mom. I am less angry. What's really interesting about this participant is that she was a trained registered nurse. Um, so again, has the training, but it's a different relationship. It's, it's a different beast to tackle. Problem solving skills, it equipped me with techniques. I feel less panicked and anxious because I could remember to breathe and meditate briefly. These are new skills for me. And finally, pain relief. There's less physical pain with deep breathing, alleviating body tensions and pain. So in terms of conclusion based on study two, cognitive benefits following MBSR is not statistically better than psychoed. MBSR provides greater benefits than psychoed in decreasing symptoms of depression and general perceived stress, but not with respect to some of these other psychosocial outcomes. Qualitative reports support the benefits of MBSR, which were more expansive than those found in the psychoed. So again, we're seeing more thematic nodes and reflect some of the teaching points that are offered in the program. Overall, taking these studies all together, Mindfulness is a tool that may be used to strengthen cognitive control and emotion regulation, but there isn't a lot of evidence for the cognitive piece. Trait mindfulness associates with more positive expectations regarding aging. We also saw that trait mindfulness associates with better psychosocial well-being and executive function. Mindfulness training may not provide immediate quantitative benefits for healthy, high-functioning older adults, and we do need more longitudinal research designs. And finally, mindfulness training may provide, may provide immediate psychosocial benefits for older persons who are chronically stressed, such as uh, informal caregivers. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I'd also like to acknowledge my graduate trainee, Sasha Malia, who conducted this research with me, my research assistants who were trained and did all the pre-post testing, as well as our participants, funding bodies, the Mind Life Institute, Ryerson, as well as our community partners. And thank you for, for your attention. Thank you.